Welcome back. Now, a landmark ruling at the High Court could change the course of how juvenile offenders are tried in a court of law. Now, according to the Children's Law, it is required that convicted minors be placed in correctional centers for no more than three years. Now, with a ruling by Justice Joel Ngugi, a teen offender could be moved from a Borstal institution to an adult prison once they turn 18. That's our discussion tonight, but first, let's take a look look at the current state of the juvenile justice system here in Kenya. Now, according to records from the magistrate's court, criminal cases filed against children have been on the rise from 2013 when 1,200 cases were recorded to this year when 2,000 381 cases uh, were recorded in the system. Now, according to experts, the holiday months are when children arrests spike in April, August, November, and December. Now, the offenses range uh, from drug trafficking, robbery with violence, stealing, defilement, or preparation to commit an offense. Now, upon conviction in a court of law, a child convict faces various sentencing options. First is a non-custodial sentence where they check in with a probation officer either weekly or monthly. They are then counseled and then progress and their progress rather assessed over a period of time. Next is the custodial sentence where the child is placed in a juvenile remand home that is designated for convicts between the ages of 10 and 14. This institution is required to cater for the education of the child and the Borstal institutions are for child convicts between the ages of 15 and 17. They usually serve three years in this institution. There are also youth correction and training centers that now cater to convicts between the ages of 18 and 21 years. They undergo a four-month program where they learn a skill or a trade such as carpentry, mechanics, or agriculture. And now joining me in studio are Jennifer Kaberi, who's a social worker and child development specialist, and Miriam Washira, who is FIDA Kenya's deputy executive director. Ladies, thank you so much for coming in. Uh, the case that we are referring to is criminal case number 71 of 2016, and this is when uh, Judge Joel Ngugi basically gave a 16-year-old convict who was accused of uh, murdering his cousin and maiming his other cousin, and he said he wasn't convinced that the Borstal Institution, which requires at least three years, would be sufficient enough to teach him a lesson. So he basically said once he turns 18, he needs to be transferred to an adult prison. What does this particular ruling mean for the juvenile justice system? I'll begin with you, Miriam. Um, the ruling, I'll say, brings a lot of confusion in the system. Uh, for once, because the law is very clear that if you're convicted when you're a child, your convictions or the offenses that you did when you're a child should not be carried into your adulthood. And that is basically the underlying principle, why we say that they go to the boss of school until uh, for three years only because right. um, the law as it is provides that even as a child once you're convicted once you turn 18 your records are supposed to be actually uh, deleted from the system mm. so if we are saying that after you turn 18 now we want to extend that sentence it's just total confusion in the mm. system I mean from the judge's justification he also said we need to protect family and the community from this individual just in case he goes on another murdering uh, rampage what do you make of that decision jennifer having dealt with various children offenders uh, for me i think if the child has been a Boston institution for three years mm -hmm. and they have not been rehabilitated right. because the point of putting them in a Boston is not to punish them mm -hmm as the ruling says, is to rehabilitate them. If the, if the child has been in a position for three years and not rehabilitated, something is wrong with the system and not the child. So we should not the, uh, punish yeah, the yeah. child because of health system. Is this, is, is this telling us we should do something mm. and change the way we rehabilitate these children? Or uh, was, what, was the, what, was, what, what is making the family fear? Do they know something mm. that the judge doesn't know about that case? Right. So this should be something that should be done in the system to, to make sure that this child, actually their, their records are deleted. Yeah. I mean, and, and just on that note, because someone could ask, 
regardless of the crime that is committed, in this case it was murder, mm -hmm. uh, the child goes to the Borstal Institution for three years and then reintegrated into society. Uh, some may feel that's, that's not enough. Mm -hmm. uh, the degree of what they did is mm -hmm. quite serious mm -hmm. and, and it also leaves a mark in terms of uh, what kind of person they become mm -hmm. later on. Mm -hmm. What would you suggest if then the Borstal Institution does not work, what can they do? Uh, to rehabilitate the child. So uh, first, uh, how, what is the system? What, is, what programs are, do they, this child go through, through the, during the, mm -hmm. the Bostel? So during the, that should the, be the start. You know, find out why did this child commit this crime? And then not, because most of the time when the children are committed, it's, there's this criminal thing hanging ar around their neck. And so there's, there's rarely a chance for finding out why did this child commit this crime? Is it a psychological mm -hmm. issue? Is it a behavioral issue? Does, it, does this child have a mental issue? Because there's a research that has been done and most of those children that are in the system, it's because they have a mental issue or they have a behavioral issue. The, so we, we, are, we are kind of dealing with the issue in the wrong way. So what are the programs, what are, what, what are the other rehabilitation issues that can be done so that the child does not have to, to carry the crime into their adulthood? Mo some of us really messed up in our teenagehood, but it has not been carried to us in our adulthood. Mm -hmm. And it's not fair for this young man or any other young, young child to be able to carry their crime to their adulthood. Miriam, you've dealt with such cases. and child offenders, it's a very sensitive matter. What makes such cases very difficult to litigate in a court of law? Uh, one, because uh, children are vulnerable. Uh, the fact that it's a child, they're vulnerable. Second, when now it comes that they are in contact with the law or in mm. conflict with the law, makes it even more vulnerable. Mm. So it, it is very sensitive where everyone dealing with the case, you're just not dealing with any other criminal case. We are dealing with a child here. Yeah. And mm. we should be thinking, how do we reform this child? How do we get a better child? Mm. How do we get a better citizen from this child? Mm. Like where it's, if it's an adult, the main purpose is usually punishment. We are, con we, we are trying the case so that at the end of the day we find uh, the person uh, capable, we convict them and we put them in prison for punishment. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to a child, we are thinking about rehabilitating. We're also looking at uh, the capability, the criminal capability of a child. We have to think, were they even aware of what they were doing? Mm -hmm. For instance, in this current case, even the judge says he thinks that the crime was because of drugs. Mm -hmm. So are we able as... Um, during the system to rehabilitate him mm. from the drugs because maybe he, he committed the crime because of the drugs so we're not saying that he has that uh, mentality or capability uh, the other thing I can say from the judgment I did not see any mention of a medical mm. uh, report mm. uh, in such an instance if it's a 16 year for him to just kill someone there must be a lot of psychological issues going on behind mm. I, I was hoping to see in the judgment that he has read from a doctor saying uh, the boy is totally okay mm. and all that so I would be looking when it comes to a child there's just too much underlying issues that mm. you're dealing with you know a lot of these kids who do commit these crimes come from very tough backgrounds uh, and very hostile environments so when thinking about defending a child how do you defend one that really hasn't had a childhood when you think about it? You know, many may think and justify and say, oh no, you know, they behave like adults anyway. That is why they carry out these crimes. But how do you, as a child lawyer, defend a child who doesn't know what it means to be a kid? It's really tough uh, because one, uh, you find that uh, there, there are other issues that you're dealing with. So it will not be just an, a legal issue yeah. you're dealing with. When you're a child's advocate, you're just dealing with a lot of society issues. You have to go beyond the law. Uh, you have to start thinking, why did you commit it? Most of the children don't even know that actually some things are crimes. So you ask them and say, yeah, I did it. And you ask them, why did you do it? I, for instance, I dealt with one, one case where a nine-year-old had burnt the small sister went to the shop, bought paraffin, poured on it, lit the fire on the small sister who was two years. Um, in such a case, he's nine. Mm. Is that a criminal, really? But when you ask him, why, why did you do that? He says, because since this girl came to this family, nobody gives me attention. I'm always a bad one. This girl is the best. Uh, when my dad, who is a stepfather, comes, he only brings a sweet for the girl, not me. You see, it's just mm -hmm. a very sensitive issue. It's no longer a legal issue. It's starting to deal with this boy. How do you deal with this new family setup? 
So as an advocate, I'll find myself going beyond legal to counseling. Mm. And oftentimes it calls mm. for that. Mm. Uh, you know, Jennifer, when it comes to, to arrests now mm -hmm. of child offenders, oftentimes there have been reports of children being put in the same cells as adults, uh, police not dealing with such cases with the sensitivity that is required. Um, what would you say is the current state in terms of child arrests? How are they being handled? Uh, we have a long way to go in Kenya. Uh, actually, this week, there could be a kind of number of reports about children who have been who have been harmed in police custody. So uh, we have, ideally, we're supposed to have a child protection unit in every police station where children who are in need of care of protection, these are children who are been, either they are lost or they are, they are just wa wandering around town and they are being put in police, they're supposed to be put. And so that child protection, ideally, according yeah. to the law, they're supposed to be in all police stations, but we don't have, they're very few, they're less than, I think, 10, the whole country. So, and, so, and in, in case there's no, uh, there's no child protection unit, the police officer is supposed to put ch those children uh, away, like f apart from the adults. But in this case, sometimes you find that is not po that, that that does not happen. Right, right. And why this is because we don't have police who are being trained on children. So uh, in this country, we have environments police who have been ta taught by NEMA on how to take mm. care of trees. We have wildlife po po police who have been taught by whoever to take care of animals, but you don't have police who take care of children who have been trained as specific force for protecting children. And that's a huge gap. So what happens, like for example, uh, uh, FIDA today trains three policemen from them in Kilimani police station, but in two months time, they will be transferred. And so there's that gap that our police force is not well equipped to mm -hmm. handle children cases. And then most of the time, uh, people think like uh, arresting and putting them in cell is the best option. But there is there, there's diversion. You can, you can be able to talk. If that child stole a chicken or two mangoes, that child was hungry. So it, there's no need of putting that child in cell. Just let them eat and then talk. Probably tell them you're going to sweep my compound for the next three days instead of putting them in custody. You know. So because of that, that lack of awareness that there are other ways that they can be used instead of taking children through the system. The system starts from the police. Okay. You know, instead of can we handle that case of a child from the community level to ensure that that child does not go through the system and actually protecting that child. So, yeah. and, and speaking of which, because you do have some groups that have taken uh, the initiative of training prison warders and police officers in terms of dealing with, but like you're saying, mm -hmm. they need to do a lot more. Mm -hmm. uh, one such group is uh, Pendekezo Letu. Mm -hmm. Of course, they're very active mm -hmm. in that space. And I spoke to an advocacy officer called Levis Kagiri, mm -hmm. and he's basically talking about the treatment of past offenders. Mm -hmm. So now once they're brought back into community to be reintegrated, there's a lot of stigma mm -hmm. attached to the fact that they did something wrong, mm -hmm. everyone knows. Mm -hmm. But take a look at what he had to say. Either been acquitted or committed, and then the term has ended in court. We will do what we will call a mediation meeting. That is a meeting between the community leaders, the law enforcement agencies, and the child and their family. Because what we've realized, especially in urban slums of Kayole, Dandora, Mathare, Uruma, Korokocho, those places, especially if a child was arrested for a, a serious offense like robbery, stealing, they will either end up being rearrested again or being extrajudicially terminated. So if you do not conduct those mediation meetings to show the police that indeed this child has been rehabilitated, he has been through a judicial process that is fair and free, then they do, for them it's like a loss. They see it, we did all the work of arresting this offender because for them he's an offender. He raised a very serious issue there when it comes to now the child coming back. They've been labeled an offender by the authorities. Uh, you know, at times it can go to the extreme of what he said, extrajudicial killings. Um, uh, what do you make of that, Miriam? Because these are still children when you think about it. They're still kids. Yeah. Uh, I think our, our main problem is that we do not understand when it comes to a child how just to deal with a child. Yeah. Uh, we want to deal with them like any other criminal. Uh, so we want, as, as a community, we reject the child, uh, not knowing that we are creating even a bigger problem. Mm. Um, and for the police, they should understand the system and how it works, so that if a child goes through a rehabilitation school, 
for instance, for three years and comes back to the society, there is no point of killing that child mm. that they're coming back as a criminal because we want to believe that being in the rehabilitation school, they have learned something and they have changed their behavior. Mm. So it's more of uh, the system working together. Uh, the system is supposed to be that uh, the child, once as they are going through rehabilitation, mm. that the officer in the home, the rehabilitation home, is working with the community. Mm -hmm. And they're supposed to be having meetings, continuous meeting as the child is also going through rehabilitation. Yeah. So in essence, we're supposed to be rehabilitating this child and rehabilitating the society that he was in. Because we say that once, if a child comes into the system, into the justice system, then his safety net has some holes in it. Mm -hmm. So as we rehabilitate this child, are we rehabilitating his safety net? Mm -hmm. And that is what we are lacking. Mm -hmm. So we, we are not talking to the community. Why, why, why did this child commit this crime? How can we help? So beyond the rehabilitation in the school, what else are we doing in the community to prepare them to receive this child? Right. Yeah. And what about preventative measures? Uh, because if they're a past offender, they've gone through the rehab process, they're brought back and right back to the same environment mm. <laughs> that they left, you know, uh, gang activity a lot of times, which they're forced into. Um, how do you deal with that before it becomes a problem, before they end up in the custody of police officers? How do you deal with them before it becomes an issue? For me, education is the key. Yeah. Yeah. So how are we educating our children, ensuring that these children actually get the, is it 12 years basic education, so that they, are, they, they, they have some anchoring, you know? Um, I had a conversation with some kids, some street kids, and they told me, you guys, you tell us we move out of the streets, but you have never given us an option, given us the, the, the picture of living out of the street. In fact, they street So, like, come show us, show mm. us why it is bad. Don't tell us to come out of the street. So, the same, the same, those are what those are kids crying out and saying, "Help us to see the positive sides." And that is, it doesn't have to be like high level kind of education. Give them some skills. If you you see like a child, I, I was uh, I was in Islands for the last few we mm. few weeks. And this is something children were telling us, that come and show us, come and develop our talents. Because we're very good maybe in painting, we're very good in artwork, and school is not our thing. You know, we, uh, you know c can you give us other options? And you know, because we are forcing, sometimes um, we force kids to, in, in a system, in an education system that is not their learning system, mm. and forcing them to go out of school, to, out of school where they get these other peers, you know. Right. And also talking of peers, peer education. Can we be able to get peers, people who can be able to teach them on g good peers and role models, you know, people who have been through the system or people who are, like for example, Victoria. Th there's a girl who wants to be like you, going to Korogosha and saying, "You can be like me. You, this is what you need to be like to be like Victoria." Yeah. But, you know, well, giving them the tools of trade so that they don't have to, to get engaged in, in crime to be able to earn, you know, earn, because income is a huge thing that forces children to go, to go into crime. Right. So what, how can you be able to safeguard the family at the family level, ensuring that this, the, the family, the parents are able to provide for the kids so that the children don't have to go to to, to crime, to right. be able to get food. Yeah. And as we wrap up, Miriam, you know, uh, this is the holiday season. Yes. One of the peak times for child arrest, for obvious reasons, idle mm -hmm. minds, and they get engaged in activities they shouldn't be. What would you tell families, parents, communities to do at this time? What do they need to be aware of? Um, I would say be deliberate with your parenting know what your child is doing at every particular time. I think one of the, the issue is that we are letting children parent themselves. Mm -hmm. We are also busy in work everywhere. So children are parenting themselves. Yeah. So can you take a deliberate uh, move to parent your child? That you know what they are doing, what they are engaging in. Uh, go out of your way to be creative, to keep them busy. Because if you are not busy, they will create their own mm -hmm. trouble. And there will be a lot of trouble. There will be the discourse arrests. They will be picked. Soon we'll be having uh, hundreds of them in court. No, if you keep in touch with your child, discuss, this is a holiday. It's two months. So what are we doing from today till the end of the holiday? 
All right. Okay. Thank you so much, Jennifer and Miriam, yeah. for your time and insights. And that does it for this conversation. And maybe take that adage of it takes a village to raise a child and take it seriously. Even if the child is not your biological, take the step of leading and mentoring them. Well, that does it for this conversation. Have a wonderful evening. I'll see you again tomorrow with Jeff Koinange. Good night.